Hello, hello! So today we're going to be taking a look at the CDU pre-flight procedure. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the CDU here, the computer display unit, to interact with the flight management system. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be entering in a bunch of information that's going to help the plane automate its flight. So there's kind of two halves to the CDU pre-flight procedure. The first half is going to be entering in navigation information. So we're going to be entering in things such as the departure airports and the departure runway, uh, also our arrival airports. We're also going to be entering in things like airways and waypoints. The second half is going to involve performance uh, data. So we're going to be entering in things such as the cost index value, the cruising altitude. I'm also going to calculate our V speeds for takeoff as well. So this is going to be a sort of a simplified way of setting up the CDU. Um, this is not going to mimic real world kind of piloting actions because um, real world pilots do take a lot more kind of variables into consideration when they're planning for a flight. Uh, but this is just going to be a more streamlined, a more simplified version just for flight simulation here. So to get all of the data that we need to enter into the CDU, what we need to do is we need to go to our flight plan and grab all of the data from there. And here is my flight plan. So for this video and the videos that follow, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be following a flight starting at London Gatwick and flying up to Inverness in Scotland. Now this flight plan that you can see on the screen just now was generated on a website called simbrief.com. Now, if you're not sure how to read a flight plan or how to generate a flight plan, I've already covered that in a separate tutorial in the past. So if you click up in the top right corner of your screen, uh, you should be able to open up a link to that video there. However, for this video, all I'm going to do is just run through this flight plan very quickly and just highlight the different bits of information we need to enter into the CDU in the 737. Okay, so first at the very top, we can find our flight number. So up here, we've got PM737. So that's going to be the flight number for our kind of fake flight between London and Inverness. If we have a look here, we have the flight number also here and also here as well. The next bit of information we need is the ICAO codes for both our departure airports and our arrival airports. If we have a look at this top line here, we've got EGKK and EGPE. And then you can see just underneath that, we've also got the uh, full name of each location there. So Gatwick to Inverness there. The next number we can grab will be the cost index. So over here on the right, we have a cruising system here and then CI cost index of 23. Now the next step is an optional step. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. Um, but what you can also grab here is the average winds. So when you're entering information into the CDU, you'll be asked to enter in the kind of the average cruising winds throughout the flights. Now I'm going to be flying the flights with the fair weather presets in FSX, which means that it's going to be essentially, you know, no wind. Um, when you generate a flight plan with Simbrief, it will actually generate the flight plan with kind of real world weather or real, wor real world wind conditions at the time that the flight plan is generated. So you can see here that the flight plan was generated on the 21st of February and the average wind conditions along this route at the time would have been from a direction of 354 at 40 knots. So if you wish, you can grab the average winds there. Um, as I said, it's not essential. The average winds just basically allow the flight management system to more accurately calculate um, the amount of time that it's going to take to reach a waypoint and also it's going to be able to more accurately calculate the amount of fuel that's going to be burned during the cruise phase of flight. The next value you can grab will be the reserve fuel amount. So in this section here, this is our fuel section and you can see we've got amounts of fuel for different kind of sections of the flight there. We've got main trip fuel, uh, contingency fuel to 15 minutes, alternate, so on and so forth. What we want here is the reserves, so fine res here, and the amount of fuel is going to be 2,298. Now remember that the PMDG liveried 737 measures its fuel weight in pounds rather than kilograms. Again, on Simbrief, before you generate the flight plan, you can select whether to measure fuel in pounds or kilograms there. As I said, that's covered in the other tutorial that I did, but for the purposes of this video, this is the information that we need.
The next value we need is going to be this block fuel here. So this is the total amount of fuel that we're going to load into the aircraft. So once we go back to the aircraft, this is going to be one of the first pieces of information that we enter in. It's not actually something that you enter in um, as part of the the actual CDU pre-flight procedure. This is kind of an extra step that we're going to put in before we start the CDU pre-flight procedure. Moving down, the next section that we have here is the flight route. So there's a couple of bits of information here. First, we've got our departure um, airport and our departure runway here. So you can see we're going to be departing from EGKK on runway 08 right. So we'll just highlight that in a different color there. And then our arrival airport is going to be EGPE Inverness, and we're going to be, or we're due to arrive on runway 05, given the current wind conditions and so on and so forth. Also on same brief, what it will do is it'll also give us our departure procedure. So here we've got this LAM 5P, so that's actually the departure procedure, which is going to take us to this LAM waypoint. So we'll just highlight that in a separate color there. And then, of course, we've got the rest of the flight route. So we've got departure airports, departure procedure, waypoints. And then it's going to be an airway. So the next, so after we reach the land waypoint, we're going to be taking the UL10 airway to the BBK waypoint. And then you can see we've got the DCT. So this is actually direct. So we're not going to be following a specific airway. We're just going to be flying direct from one waypoint to the next. So we're going to be flying direct to Evson. And then again, direct to Bulby, direct to TLA. And then we're going to be following their way, UL613 to Findo. And then at the end here, it says direct to Inverness. Now, what I'm going to do in the later videos, I'm actually going to calculate or we're going to plan the arrival um, in a later video during the cruise phase of flights. So what I normally do at this point is just copy the flight route up to the final waypoint here. So grab that there. Now on some um, some flight plans, you may also be given an arrival star um, or arrival procedure. Um, if you have that, by all means, make a note of that as well. But what I personally like to do is just follow the flight route up to the final waypoints. And then, as I said, in a later video, we'll cover planning for the arrival during the cruise phase of flights. Uh, because Inverness is quite a small airport, it doesn't have any stars. So planning the arrival can be a bit um you got a bit more freedom when you're planning your arrival um at an airport like Inverness which doesn't have a, a set published procedure okay so once you've got all of that data uh the next section here you don't necessarily need it for the cdu but it's often good to make a note of it um is the amount of time that the flight's going to take so we've got the time section here and you can see that we've been given four times so out basically represents the time that we're due to be pushing away from the gate. Off is the time that we're due to take off. On is the time that we're due to land. And in is the time that we're due to park and um, sort of shut the engines down back at Inverness. So we've got four separate times there. And then the block time is the total amount of time that uh, the entire flight will take from pushback. So from the time that we push back from... Uh, our gate at Gatwick to the time that we park at Inverness should be 1 hour and 49 minutes there. Okay, and one of the last bits of information that we can grab here is the passenger number. So just below that, we've got the weight section here, and we've got packs, which represents passengers, and we're due to have 168 passengers on board. Also, if you choose to fly with cargo, you will get your cargo weights in there. If I remember correctly, on SimBrief, you have to manually enter the cargo weight. You, I don't think there's an option to automatically select a cargo weight there, but that's where you would get the weight of cargo in there. Okay, and the last value that we can grab is our cruising altitude. So if we have a look at the next page down, you can see here that we get a bunch of detailed information about each kind of waypoint and airway along our route here. So we've got Gatwick, and then we've got the LAM 5P, we've got various waypoints along this LAM 5P departure all the way down to Lambourne here. So that's the end of our departure procedure. Now the waypoint that we're looking for is going to be this TOC which represents top of climb. And if we have a look at this column here, the top number here is actually going to be our cruising or our flight level or our cruising altitude there. So you can see that we've got 360 which would be 36,000 feet. 
Okay, and that's pretty much the basics of everything that we need to enter into the CDU. So let's jump back into the plane now and start doing that. Okay, so here we are back in the plane. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop the CDU out here just so it's a bit easier to, uh, to see and read for you guys here. So at the moment we've got this message on the CD which says enter IRS position. That's something that we'll address in a moment so we can just clear that message by hitting the clear button down in the bottom right corner there. So I mentioned during the, as we were looking through the flight plan, I mentioned that we're going to kind of do a couple of steps before we actually start the official procedure. So what we're going to do is we're going to enter in the fuel and the amount of passengers just so the plane has that weight kind of or that data on board so it can more accurately calculate weights and fuel usage and things like that so to do that we need to go into FS actions uh, we need to go into fuel at the top here so just hit the button next to that and what we want to do is the block fuel value that we had we just want to enter that into the total fuel at the top here in the top left so there's two ways that we can do that we can either enter in the information by tapping each of the keys so the block fuel for the flight was 14,688 so we can type that in there manually or alternatively if you prefer using your keyboard if you hold the tab button on your keyboard you can see that the scratch pad at the line at the bottom where we enter in information gets highlighted and now we can enter in information using well, while you hold down the tab button we can enter in information using the keyboard so it was 14,688 and then once that's been typed into the scratch pad you just hit the button next to total pounds there to enter that, in, that uh, fuel value in there and what the PMDG aircraft will do is it'll automatically enter the fuel into the correct tanks there so you don't need to worry about manually you know halving the number or working out how much fuel goes in which tank the PMDG will do that automatically for you just entering the total amount of fuel there so the second step that we need to do is we need to enter in the payload so this is going to be our passenger and cargo kind of weight values here so we had a total of 168 passengers on board and those of you to do some quick maths up in the top left here you'll realize that we cannot actually enter in 168 passengers the most we can enter in is 162 so not a big deal that's fine all I'm going to do is I'm just going to max out the first class and the coach class here so I'm going to go 12 passengers for first class hit the button there to enter that number into there then we're going to go 150 into coach class into that in there now remember that we didn't have any cargo on board so I'm just going to hit zero into that into the forward cargo hit zero into that into the aft cargo and you can see that the PMTG at all times was automatically adjusting uh, the kind of the payloads there and calculating the weights weights up here now the reason that we have zero cargo is that sort of bag passenger baggage or the weight of the bags is kind of like a nominal value based on how many passengers are on board the plane so the the weight of the passengers and their baggage is kind of a, a nominal value that's automatically added um, you don't have to manually enter in any cargo values for the passengers it's all calculated as part of the passenger numbers there okay so once we've done that we can hit return and then hit return again to bring us back to this kind of this main menu which is not part of the real boring CDU okay and now we are ready to go into the proper CDU pre-flight procedure so if you want to follow along using your own documentation or your own copy of PMTG's documentation you can find this procedure in the FCOM 1 manual on page 79 so to get into the actual FMC or the simulation of the Boeing FMC, just tap the button next to FMC here and you can see that it brings us to this IDENT page. So the first page that we need to check is this IDENT page and we just need to check a couple of bits of information here. First we want to check the model of the aircraft, so we are definitely flying in a Boeing 737-800. Next we want to check the engine rating, so that's the amount of power that the engines can generate and it is 26,000 pounds of thrust. 
Um, for anyone who's wondering what this page is, basically we're just making sure that the the sort of the software that's been um, installed on the flight computers matches the soft you know matches the plane. Um, for example, if we were flying a Boeing 737 and we saw some ident information saying a 747-800, then we know that the software doesn't match the actual plane that, that it's been installed in and there would be a problem there. So we're just double checking to make sure that the software matches the actual aircraft that we're flying in. The next thing we can check is this AIRAC data. Now for us flight simmers, unfortunately, more often than not, we might find that we get this message here, which says nav data out of date. Now for us being flight simmers, it's not a big deal. Um, basically, nav data or AIRAC data is all of the data which um, comprises things like nav aids. So that tells you, so the, the computer data contains things like the radio frequencies of all the different nav aids. It contains you know, runway information for all airports, um, such as like the length and width of the runway. And it just contains a, a lot of navigation related data. In the real, in the real world, this data is updated every 28 days. However, us flight simulators don't get that luxury. Now there are services online which provide up to date AIRAC data, but um, if you're a flight simmer, it's absolutely not necessary. It's a nice thing to have, but it is not absolutely necessary to fly this plane. So you can get away with flying with out of date nav data. So that's what I'm going to do for this flight. And I'm just going to simply clear this message here uh, to acknowledge it and say, that's okay. We're, I'm happy to fly with out of date nav data. Okay, so once we've checked um, all of the information up here at the top, and we're happy that everything is okay up there. Um, that's the ident page covered. The next page that we need to go into is the POS init page. And you can see here that we have actually have a nice little shortcut to it down at the bottom here. So we're just going to tap on this button to go to the POS init or the position initialization. So the first thing I'm going to do is enter in the ICAO code for our ref airport. So this is the airport that we're currently sat at. And it's most likely going to be the airport that we're going to be departing from. So for Gatwick, the code is echo golf kilo kilo egkk so you just type that into the scratch pad at the bottom there and then tap this button next to ref airports to paste the ICAO code into there and you can see that it automatically picks up a GPS position for the airport now again this is some of that nav data that I was talking about there are things like GPS positions of nav aids things like that the next step however is to get the act our kind of a more accurate GPS position because this GPS position here will be the actual geographical center of the airport it's not the actual position of the plane so to get the GPS position of the plane what we need to do is go on to the next page of this position initialization here so if we have a look at this kind of se selection of buttons here we have previous page and next page here click on next page once and you can see that we have position reference here now what we're going to do is we're going to copy one of these GPS values which are being taken from the GPS units, the GPS hardware units in the plane and we're going to paste that into our CDU to tell the CDU where our actual position is. So very simply, just hit the button next to one of these GPS readings. I believe in the real life pilots normally favour the right unit over the left. There may be a very slight discrepancy here, you can see we've got uh, 9.4 and 9.5 uh, but I believe that pilots use the right system more often than the left. So just hit the button next to GPS right there, and you'll see that that copies our GPS position into the scratch pad. Now, if we go back to the previous page, you can see that that data is kept in the scratch pad, and then we just paste it into the set IRS position here by tapping on the button on the side. Now you notice there that the line disappeared and you also see that all of our screens also kind of went live as well. So the reason that we had that set IRS position before was because we hadn't done that step yet. Okay, so once we've entered in the IRS position, the next step is to start entering in some route information. You can see again, very conveniently, we have a shortcut to the route page here. So the first thing we need to do is enter in at the origin. So this is where, where we're going to be departing from. And you can see here that the 737 CDU rather cleverly has already given us EGKK. 
So we entered that in as our reference airport and the CDU has suggested that we're going to be departing from this airport, which we are. So it's already in the scratch pad there. So we just paste that into the origin section there. Next, we need to enter in our destination. So that's the ICAO code for the airport that we're going to be flying to. So we're going to be flying to Inverness, which is Echo Golf Papa Echo. And then copy that in there. Now, at this point, what you could do is if you have downloaded the flight plan, if you're using a website like Simbrief, you can actually download the flight plan um, so that you can um, automatically uh, load it into the FMS. Now, I'm going to cover, in, in this video, I'm going to do it manually, but if you want to see how to load in the flight plan more quickly, um, I've done a little appendix at the end of this video, so if you want to skip to the end of this video to see how to do that, I'd recommend that you do that there. However, for this video, I'm just going to skip that, and we're going to enter in the route manually there. The final step on this route page is to enter in the flight number. So the flight number was PM737, type line to scratch pad, paste that into the flight number there. Okay, so the next step that I like to do is go into the departures and arrivals page. So if we have a look at the selection of buttons here, um, and for anyone who doesn't know, these buttons are basically shortcuts to different pages within the CDU. You can see we've got init ref, route, climb, cruise, descent, menu. The menu button is actually more of a, um, a simulator only thing, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so that brings you back to this kind of simulator menu. So the menu button is probably not something you'd see in the real aircraft. Um, we've got legs, departures and arrivals, holding and progress there. So we want to go to the departures and arrivals page. So what we're going to be doing um, in this page is we're going to be selecting our departure runway and also our departure procedure. So you can see that we've got two lines of data. We've got EGKK, so we've got Gatwick there and Inverness there. So we're going to be departing from Gatwick. So we're going to go over to the departure side here on the left and tap on that button. Now you can see here that we've got quite a lot of data. Um, basically, on the left, you've got our we've got our SIDs. So these are all of the departure procedures, and we can actually click on next page, and we can see that we've got pages upon pages of departure procedures. If you look up in the top right, you can see how many pages we've got. So we've got, we're currently on page five, and we've got eight pages worth of departure procedures. Now. What I like to do is select the departure runway first, because what that will do is that will actually filter the list of SIDs that we can use from that one runway. So we're going to be departing from runway 08 right, so I'm going to tap on the button next to that, and you can see that it selects 08 right. And you can see now on the page list there, we've got only page 1 of 2, so what that will do is that will filter the list of procedures that we have. And we're going to be taking the LAM 5P uh, departure procedure, as our flight plan told us. We've got LAM 5P there, so we're just going to tap the button next to that, and we're going to select that there. Okay, so now we've got the very start of the flight already planned with our departure runway and our departure procedure. Now what we're going to do is go in and manually enter in the, kind of the majority of the routes up to that final waypoint. So to do that, we go back to the route page here. So we've got the route page shortcut there. Just tap that there. So once we're back on the route page, we need to go to next page. And you can see here that we have a little bit more information. So we can see that we've got via LAM 5P. So that's our departure procedure. And the final waypoint of that departure procedure is that LAM waypoint. So now what I'm going to do is enter in the rest of the routes from that LAM procedure. So what we're going to be doing is on the left side, we're going to be entering in airways. On the right side, we're going to be entering in waypoints. So if we look back at our flight route, the first airway that we're going to be following is UL10. So I'm just going to type that in there. Again, if you want, you can use your keyboard to type the, these in. So we're going to be flying via the UL10 airway, and we're going to be flying to the BPK waypoints. Now the next uh, leg of the journey is actually going to be a direct flight. Now we can't, we don't have a, an airway, so what we're going to do, we're just going to skip the airway, and we're very simply going to just enter in the next waypoint there. So we'll go from BBK. We're going to be flying direct to Evson. So we just type in Evson here, type that in there, and you can see that it automatically figures out that it's a direct uh, leg of the journey there. 
The next leg of the journey is going to be direct to Bowlby. Just enter that in there again. And then the next leg of the journey is going to be direct to TLA. And something interesting is about to happen here. Oh dear, what's the, all this? So, basically what this is, is there are several nav aids in the world which have the designation TLA. Um, so what you want to do is, if, if you can't figure out exactly which one that you need, what you need to do is go back to your flight plan and you'll s find some more specific information related to the waypoint that you need. Okay, and here we are back with our flight plan. So I've just gone down to sort of uh, the last couple of significant pages uh, where we have all of our waypoint information here. So what you want to do is just scroll down until you find the waypoints. So we've got TLA, we've got TALA here. So what you want to do is just make a note of the radio frequency. So you can see here that it's going to be a VOR station, so 113.8. And if we have a look at the next column, this is giving us our GPS coordinates here. So we've got north 5529.9 and west 321.2. So just make a note of those two bits of information there and we should be able to use those to find which, um, which waypoint to select back on the CDU. Okay, so back in the plane, uh, if we have a look at the top result here, this is actually the one that we need. So we can see that it's a VOR DME with a frequency of 113.8. And then we also have a look at the GPS position of the nav aid there. That also matches up with what we had on the flight plan. So the top one is the one that we want. So we'll just tap the button next to that. And you can see that we now have direct to TLA. Now we have one final um, leg of the journey, which is to follow UL613 to the Findle waypoint. However, we've run out of space. What do we do? Very simply, go over to the next page, and you can see that it gives us some more space to enter in more route information there. So we're going to be flying airway UL613 to Findle. And that's going to be the last kind of major waypoint along the journey. Now, as I said earlier, we're going to be looking at setting up the arrival during the cruise phase of flight. So that's all that I'm going to do for the route information there. Okay, so the final step that I like to do is to just double check the uh, departure procedure just to make sure that um, everything that's been automatically entered in the CDU matches what you would find on the aviation chart for that departure procedure. So to do that, we need to go to the legs page. And you can see here that we have sort of some more details about each specific waypoint along the journey. So what I'm also going to do just now is I'm going to go and find some uh, aviation charts for London Gatwick. Okay, so I get this question a lot. Where do you find your aviation charts? And this is it. Very simply is Google. This is where I find my aviation charts. So if you want to find the charts for Gatwick, the most effective way that I've found to find aviation charts is to enter the ICAO code of the airport followed by the word charts. So for Gatwick, it would be EGKK charts. And you can see there that we have a bunch of results already relating to um, Gatwick Airport and you can see we've got Vatsim, Jeppensen and all aviation related stuff. So normally it's going to be in the top three results that you're going to find the charts that you want. So we're going to go to this website here. I can see that we've got London Gatwick and we've got a bunch, a whole bunch of charts uh, relating to primarily these are all um, I mean the top half of this is all departure procedures but a couple of charts that are going to be um, worth having are going to be the aerodrome chart so that's going to give you a generic kind of map of the airport so you're going to be able to see all of the different aprons uh, runways and taxiways and things like that uh, once it takes time to load up there you go there's an example there uh, but what we're looking for is we're looking for a chart which um, describes the departure procedure that we're going to be taking. And just to save you guys time, here it is here. So you can see we've got standard departure charts, instrument SID, um, runway 08 right. So you want to make sure that the chart matches the runway that you're going to be taking off from. And also see it says here at LAM 5P. So you also want to make sure that it matches the specific variation of the departure procedure. So we're going to click on that. And you can see here that we have the charts. 
So if you're not sure how to read departure charts, again, I've already covered this in a separate tutorial video. If you click up in the top right corner there, um, I describe in that video how to read charts like this and also um, you know how to decipher them and understand what to do during the departure procedure. So what we're basically looking for on a departure chart like this are any altitude restrictions or any speed restrictions. Um, and also, of course, we just want to make sure that the, the sort of the basic um, kind of the waypoints or intermediary waypoints along the departure procedure um, all match up with what the CDU has automatically entered. So we're going to be taking off and then shortly after takeoff, we're going to have like a slight left hand turn here um, and then we're going to be uh, kind of joining this Detling VOR here. So one of the waypoints is going to be this Detling uh, at a distance of 20 nautical miles. So um, if you were going to be flying this manually, what we'd need to do is set um, the, uh, or tune into the Detling VOR, set it ourselves on a course for a radial of 260, and then at 20 nautical miles, we would then join that radial and fly directly towards the Detling VOR. You can see here that we have this ACORN waypoint, and you can see here that we have this altitude restriction of 5,000. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. So the line above and below the number means that we need to be at exactly 5,000 feet at that waypoint. Um, so again, we're just going to double check that on the CDU once we go back to it. And then once we reach a distance of 10 nautical miles from the Detling VOR, we make a left hand turn. And then we tune, then if we were doing this again manually, we would then have to tune into the Lambourne VOR and then basically follow that in on a radial of 157, as it says there. And then at Lambourne, a distance of 15 nautical miles, we still need to be at 5,000 feet. And then at Lambourne, a distance of 10 nautical miles, we need to climb up to 6,000 feet and hold that. And then once we pass over the Lambourne VOR, again, we need to be at 6,000 feet. Now, if you're flying with air traffic control, um, it's more likely that air traffic control may give you some specific instructions after takeoff. So they might give you a specific heading to follow, or they may clear you to a different altitude to follow along this departure procedure. So always take air traffic control's instruction over what is published here. But if air traffic control just asks you to follow the procedure as it is, then follow the procedure as you see it on the chart here. Okay, so looking at the CDU again, so we're just going to check the uh, the various legs. So all of these legs are going to be matching, should be matching up to what we had on the departure chart there. So we've got the first way, waypoint, IGG 3.5 miles there. Um, we've got that there. And then we're going to be flying to the Detling 20, a distance of 20 nautical miles. So that's there. And then we've got Acorn there. Now the numbers here, we can see that we've got forward slash 5,000 feet. So that's telling the flight management systems that we've got a hard altitude restriction of 5,000 feet there. If we have a look at the altitude restriction above there, we've got 702A. So that means that at this IGG waypoint, we need to be at 702 feet or above. Um, you may also see uh, an altitude and a B there, which means uh, that altitude or below. Um, but if you don't see a letter afterwards, that means that it's kind of like a hard altitude restriction there. So the aircraft must be at 5,000 feet, not above it, not below it, must be at 5,000 feet. So we've got Detling 20, we've got Acorn there, we've got Detling 10 there, which matches the chart. Uh, we've got the Lambourne, distance of 15 nautical miles, again at 5,000 feet. Uh, so that's all matching the chart there. If we go over to the next page, We've got the LAM, LAM born there at a distance of 10 nautical miles, and you can see that we've got the altitude restriction at 6,000 feet there. And then at LAM born, again, we've got the hard restriction there at 6,000 feet. So I'm happy that the route has been entered in correctly. I'm happy that the departure procedure is correct, and all of the constraints there are all correct as well. So once I'm happy that the route is all okay, I'm going to hit this button next to activate at the bottom. And you can see that the little light above execute comes in. So what I'm going to do now is hit the execute button. And what that does is that now kind of sets the route into the flight management system. We're now going to be following that route, that departure procedure. Okay, so that's all of the navigation side of things done. Now we need to go in and enter in all of the performance data into the CDU. 
So the first thing we need to do is go into the performance initialization page. However, we don't have a shortcut for it here. Oh dear, well, where do we go? What do we do? Very simply, we just go to the init ref page. So we click on init ref there and that takes us to the perf init page there. So the first thing we need to do is enter in the zero fuel weights. Now, normally pilots will have this listed on their flight plan. However, the PMDG aircraft will conveniently calculate it for calculate that value for you. So very simply, find the line here which says ZFW, zero fuel weight. Tap on the button once and it will automatically calculate the weight for you there. And then tap the button the second time to enter it in there. Now the next step is to actually check the upper display unit there. You just want to make sure that you have this takeoff um, indication up at the top there. So that tells that shows that the engine uh, computers are kind of ready for takeoff essentially. The next value that we're going to enter in is going to be the reserve fuel amount. So the exact amount was going to be 2,298 pounds. That's what our flight plan told us. However, here what we're going to do is we're going to simply round it to the nearest value there. So we're going to go for 2.3 thousand pounds of fuel into that, into the reserves there. The next value we can enter is going to be the cost index. So our flight plan told us a cost index of 23. We're just going to type in 23, enter it into the cost index. The next bit of data we can enter is going to be the cruising altitude. So we were going to have a cruising altitude or flight level of 360. Now there's several ways you can enter this in. You can type in FL360, uh, you can type in just 360, or you can type in 36,000 feet. All formats will result in the correct flight level being entered in there. Now remember earlier I mentioned that those cruising winds were kind of an optional step if you were using real world weather for example. Uh, this next line here is where you could enter in that information if you choose to use it. Uh, as I said I'm going to be using the fair weather preset so I'm not going to be entering in that but any time that I fly on a live stream with real world weather I will make a note of the kind of the average winds throughout the flights and I would enter in that information at this line here. The next bit of information we can enter in is going to be the transition altitude. So for that we need to go back to our departure procedure charts. Now normally on a departure procedure chart you'll have the transition altitude listed on there. So if we have a look at the top here, it's kind of small but hopefully you can see it there. We've got transition altitude of 6,000 feet. So you can normally find the transition altitude on your departure charts um, and that's for um, any airports around the world. Okay, so that was 6,000 feet. Type that in, just overwrite the basic transition altitude in there, and that's all good to go. So, once you've filled in all of those bits of information here on the perf init page, uh, all we need to do now is simply execute that information and tell the plane, yep, that's the performance data that we want for our flights. You'll see, you'll notice that after we've entered in the cruising altitude, I believe the lights came on at that point. Um, I can't remember where I'm afraid, but um, yeah, once you've entered in all of that information on this page, um, then you're ready to go. So once the, the execute light has come on, just hit execute there. You can see that we get actual perfor performance um, to confirm that that's what's been selected and it's been kind of um, executed in the flight management system there. So now that we've executed that information, we're actually not finished with the performance setup of the plane. There's actually a few more steps that we need to go through. So first we need to go over to the N1 limit page and you can see here we have our convenient shortcut again. So here on this D rate page, what this allows us to do is to run the engines at a lower power setting than their maximum. And the reason that airlines will do this is because it saves on maintenance costs, it gives the engine a bit more life and it just saves general wear and tear on the engines. Now there's two ways that we can derate the engine. First is by using something called an assumed temperature. So what, what we can do is if you have performance calculating software, um, it will automatically calculate something called an assumed temperature, which you can then enter to get uh, a very kind of specific engine derate. Um, the other one here, the more basic version, which is what I like to use because I don't have any performance software, is to use something called a fixed derate. So what that does is that will derate the engines by a fixed amount, um, which is easy to select. It's very quick and simple. 
Um, however, it's probably not the most efficient way of derating the engines. Alternatively, you can derate, but you can use both an assumed temperature and a fixed derate, um, but that's another topic for another video. So for this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the 22k derate. So you can see we've got several options here. We've got uh, the, the normal takeoff power, which is 26,000 pounds of thrust. We've got takeoff one, which is 24, sorry, 24,000 pounds of thrust. And then we've got takeoff two, which reduces the engines to 22,000 pounds worth of thrust. You can see here on this aircraft, we also have a um, an engine power bump here. So we can actually bump the engines up to 27,000 pounds of thrust. Um, not all aircraft will have this option. Um, I believe that um, an airline can choose to have these various D rates. Um, so some aircraft may have these D rates, uh, some aircraft may not have all of these options. But I'm just going to select a 22k D, D rate. Um, normally on a longer runway, um, where you've got more space to accelerate the plane, uh, usually it's best to kind of derate the engines as much as you can uh, while still being able to fly safely off the takeoff. Um, on the right hand side, we also have um, options to derate the climb performance of the plane. Now, because we're flying a relatively short haul flight, um, I'm actually going to leave the climb performance at its normal level. Um, because for short haul flights it's usually better for aircraft to just get up to their cruising altitude quickly uh, spend as much time at high altitude cruising as possible because um, that just saves again that's more efficient as a more efficient form of flying um, probably on longer haul flights or you know longer flights longer distances um, you can get away with reducing engine performance during the climb there but uh, on short haul flights usually you leave it uh, up at the top as far as I understand it Okay, so once you've selected your D-rate there, you may have noticed on the upper display unit there that uh, takeoff 2 is now indicated at the top there. So that just confirms that the um, engine controls there, the engine computers, uh, now recognize that we're going to be using a fixed D-rate uh, of takeoff 2 there. And you can see that the N1 bugs here have also gone, they were, I believe at uh, 26k, they would have been up at 98.9 at uh, 24,000 pounds of thrust, they're at 94.6, and then at 22, they're at 92.5. So again, that's more than enough um, for us because it's a, a relatively short haul flight. Um, the main consideration here is that we want to be able to still be able to fly normally, even if we had a, an engine failure immediately after takeoff. The D rates, we want to make sure that uh, the engines are not kind of reduced in power enough to uh, kind of jeopardize the aircraft, but with a 22k D rate, that's normally fine for a long runway takeoff. Okay, so once we've entered in or we've selected all of the D rates that we need to here or entered in our assumed temperature, uh, the next and final page that we're going to be entering in, in data is going to be the takeoff page. So on the takeoff page, we actually need to do something a little strange. Uh, we actually need to go to takeoff page number two before we enter in data on takeoff page number one. And the reason that we do that is because we need to enter in a bit of wind information and a bit of information specific to the runway that we're going to be using. And um, depending on the wind conditions, that's actually going to change the V speeds that we're going to be using. So if we entered in the information on page one and then entered in the information on page two, what that would do is that would cancel the V speeds that we've got in here. So it's usually best to enter in information on page two first, then come back to page one, and then the V speeds only need to be calculated once. So the first bit of information that we enter on page two is going to be the runway wind conditions. So at this point of the flight, or sorry, this point of the setup, usually it's good to listen to the airport's ATIS um, weather report or METAR report to find out what the actual weather, wind conditions are Sorry, at the airport. Um, because I'm going to be flying with the fair weather presets, there's going to be no wind. But obviously, if you're flying with real world weather conditions or a real world weather add ons such as Active Sky, now would be a good time to enter in specific runway uh, wind conditions there. Uh, because I'm using the, pre the fair weather preset, it's just going to be uh, zero, winds calm, zero degrees at zero knots. But obviously, you enter in the wind conditions, what direction the wind is coming from, and then what speed the wind is at. 
The next thing to do is to select the runway condition. So you can see that we have three options here at runway condition. We've got dry, wet, and I believe that SKR is a skid resistant runway. So that's um, a special, uh, specially kind of constructed runway, which has got, I believe, grooves which prevent uh, skidding or reduce the risk of skidding. Um, so you simply just tap the button there based on the weather conditions. Uh, because I'm going to be flying with fair weather, we're just going to have that set to dry. And then finally, we need to enter in the runway slope. In FSX, this is very simple because every single runway in FSX is perfectly flat. So unfortunately, it's a limitation of the sim. Uh, so the runway slope is just going to be zero degrees. But normally, uh, runways either have like a you know slightly slope up or down. Uh, once you average out the kind of the elevation of both ends of the runway and the middle of the runway there'll be a, a very slight gradient so that needs to be taken into consideration as well in real life um, however in the sim as I said all the runways are perfectly flat so you just enter in zero in there okay and that's all the information that we need there so now we can go back to page one and enter in our final pieces of information so first we're going to be entering our takeoff flap setting. Now I believe normally it's a takeoff uh, setting of 5 degrees. Uh, however, if you're doing some short field performance, if you've got like a relatively short runway and you need more lift performance, I believe you can go up to flaps 15 for takeoff. Um, I might, I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, do correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, next, we can enter in the center of gravity. Now, this is another value that PMTG can automatically calculate for you. So to get the trim value here, what we need to do is just tap the center of gravity button once. It calculates the center of gravity. Tap it again to enter it in there. And you can see that it gives us a trim value of 5.02 there. And then finally, we can enter in the V speeds here. So we've got V1, V rotate, and V2. You can see that we've got 134, 134, 142. So to enter those in, very simply just tap the button next to each value. So that it's listed there. And if we come over to the primary flight display, um, it's probably a bit hard to see because we've got the speed bug there. But you can see we've got V1, 134 there. Okay, and after all of that, after you've done all of that, that is the CDU pre-flight procedure completed and that's going to wrap up this video unless you want to stick around and watch the little appendix that I've got at the end of this one. Um, what I'd recommend doing is I'd recommend leaving the CDU here on its takeoff ref page uh, because you will need to come back to this page and pick up a few numbers from this page later on in the uh, setup of the plane. Um, but uh, as for this video, that's all I'm going to cover. The next video, we're going to be taking a look at the pre-flight procedure. So that's where we're going to take a look at the overhead panel and the forward panels again. And we're just going to look at um, configuring the plane, making sure that all of the switches are in the right position uh, to prepare the plane for uh, departure, essentially. So um, if you want to stick around and watch a little appendix at the end of this video, please do. Uh, but that's essentially the end of this video. So for now, thank you all very much for watching. Take Take care out there and I will catch you all later. Okay, so welcome to this little appendix where we're going to talk about entering in a company route or kind of loading in a saved flight plan. So what a company route is, is it something that allows an airline to save a flight plan and then just enter it in quickly? So rather than have the pilots manually enter the airways and waypoints every single time they jump into a flight, if a company flies the same flights every day, possibly the same flight multiple times a day, then they can enter in a company route which already has the flight plan saved, already has all of the waypoints and airways saved, and it, as I said, it just reduces the workload for the pilots by automatically loading in all of that information into the CDU. So before we actually enter in the company routes, let's take a look at how we download the flight plan or let's talk about you know where we need to save the flight plan on your computer. Okay, so what you can see on your screen just now is simbrief.com. This is a website that I use to generate my flight plans. Um, you don't have to use Simbrief. You can use flight planning software if you have some. Um, but I just want to kind of use this to, to talk about the sort of the principles of saving a flight plan. So I've just generated a flight plan. And if I scroll down to the bottom here, we can see that we have a section which says flight plan downloads. 
So what you can see on your screen here is that you can, or what you can do is you can download the flight plan in many different formats and you'll see here that all of the formats relate to different add-on aircraft from different developers. So what we want to do is we want to go down to the PMDG flight plan here and then we would download this flight plan. Now I've already done that but you can download the flight plan. Alternatively, if you have flight planning software, there should be an option to export to a particular file type. And you'll notice here, if we have a look at the second column of data, that we have all of these different file names and all of these different file extensions, which relates to the different uh, add-on aircraft and different sort of various add-ons for flight simulation, um, or flight simulators rather. Now the other thing that you need to make a note of is the actual name of the file here. So you'll notice that for the PMDG, we've got EGKK EGPE. Now if we have a look at some of the other f file f name formats, we can see that we've got EGKK hyphen EGPE, and then we've also got EGKK EGPE01. So what you want to do is just make a name of the actual file name there itself because that will be important when we enter the company routes into the CDU. Okay, so once you've downloaded the flight plan, you need to put it into the correct location on your computer. So I'm just going to open up Windows Explorer here. And the first thing you need to do is navigate to your main FSX or prepared install folder. So for me, I use FSX Steam Edition. So here I've navigated into my Steam folder, Steam Apps, Common, FSX. Now within your simulator folder, there should be a folder called PMDG. So we'll just click into that. And then the next folder we need to go into is Flight Plans. So we click into that. And then here you'll have your different PMDG aircraft listed. So you can see here I've got the PMDG 747 and also the 737 NGX. So it's the NGX that I want to use this flight plan with. So I'm going to go into the NGX folder and you can see there that I've already copied the flight plan in. So you could either download the flight plan directly to that folder or you could just download the flight plan normally and then copy and paste it into this folder. But once the flight plan is in this folder, then it's ready to be used by the sim. Okay, so back in the plane, what I've done is I've just gone through and done the initial couple of steps for the CDU pre-flight. So here we are in the position initialization page, just entered in the IRS position and all of our screens have just gone live. So now we go over to the route page. Now on the route page, we don't actually need to enter in the origin or the destination because that information is already part of the flight plan. So you'll notice here on the scratch pad that EGKK has already been typed in because that's what we selected as our ref airports on the page before. Now this is where the file name comes in, it is important. If you remember the file name, it was simply EGKK EGPE. No dashes, no numbers, just the two IKO codes. So what you do next to enter the company routes is simply just type in the file name. So it was EGKK EGPE in that format, and then we paste that into the company routes. And you can see that it automatically selects the origin and the destination there. Now something we do still need to do is we do still need to enter in the flight number. So the flight for this flight number was just PM737. So what we can do is if we go onto the next page, we can actually check the route to make sure that it does make sense. So you can see that we're going to LAM and then it's UL10 to BBK direct to Evson, Bulby, TLA, and then UL613 to Findo. So if you remember back to earlier on in the video where I talked about the flight plan and the different airways and waypoints, that's all correct. However, there is one issue. This first airway here says VIA is direct to LAM. So what the, the um, company routes will not do is it will not select the departure runway or the departure procedure. So we still need to go and select those manually. So very simply, go into the Departures and Arrivals page, go into EGKK Departures, and you would, as before, select your departure runway, which filters the list of SIDs, and then select your departure procedure, LAM 5P. So now if we go back to the route page, we can see now that it says LAM 5P to the LAM waypoint, and then the rest of the route is correct as before. 
and then once again it's usually worth going back into the legs page just to double check the departure procedure to just check all of the uh, sort of the various subway points along the departure procedure and check all of the constraints to make sure that all of the speed constraints and the altitude constraints are all correct there and then to finalize everything once you're happy that everything is correct you would just simply activate and execute as normal so you can see there how the company route saves a bit of time by not having to manually enter in all of the waypoints. Um, it's much more useful, particularly on longer distance routes where you may have you know a lot more waypoints to enter in. Um, as I said, it's usually something that companies, um, you know, it's usually a feature that companies will make use of if they're flying the same route daily um, and using the same waypoints and the same airways. So there you go. That's using a company route, and that's how you would use a downloaded flight plan.